Hi, dear listeners. This is Oshaya, your host. If you love our show, I have a favor to ask. Could you kindly leave us a review on iTunes and Apple Podcasts? Your reviews go a long way in helping us do better, and we read every single one of them. I thank all of you in advance for leaving those reviews. The interview you are about to listen to is particularly significant for us here at Origins Africa Podcast. It's the first interview we ever recorded. Many, many thanks to Tosin Duratoye, who believed in us and supported by giving us a yes when I asked to interview her, especially when we had nothing at the time to show but a dream, a desire to bring to you, our dear listeners, the origin stories of Africa's dream achievers. This interview was recorded last year, and Tosin was, at the time, the COO of Fumor Realty. So, this episode captures Tosin's origin story up to December 2019. But, Tosin has recently moved on from Fumor Realty and is now the CEO of Consilia Advisory. And yes, you bet that Origins Africa podcast will be catching up with her soon. So guys, this episode is a major part of our own origin story. Enjoy. You have your passport, you don't need a visa. And I was like, eh, who said that? <laughs> Hello, so yeah. So since the day I still joke that it must be my village people that were calling me back because I don't understand. Because I, in my mind, I told myself that I would never move back. And why was that? My father told me life is not a bit of roses. This is Origins Africa podcast, where we explore the origin stories of people who have made and are making their dreams come true, asking the what, the when, the how, and the why. I'm Oshaya, and on this episode, we'll be exploring Tosin Dorotoye's story on feeling the fear and doing it anyway to live your best life. Tosin is the CEO of the Bloom Africa and COO of Fillmore Realty. Not often do you see many Nigerians in diaspora wanting to return to Nigeria to start a life, especially as moving to the abroad is the dream for many Nigerian households, with the hope that over there they would have access to a better life. In fact, relocation has become one of the topmost reasons for employee turnover in organizations today, further worsening the alarming rate of brain drain in the country. But on that unremarkable day in 2015, Tosin Dorotoy decided to leave it all. The great and impactful work she was doing, the great salary and perks she had, and her home for over 20 years, the United States. She decided to leave all and return to Nigeria. It was a scary decision for her, with panic attacks sometimes. But she felt the fear and did it anyway. Today, Tosin is the dream executor, the consultant strategist, CEO of Bloom Africa and COO of Fumo Realty. She also served as the director of Greenhouse Lab, where she established the first female-focused tech accelerator program, as well as the only then powered by Google accelerator program in Africa, amongst all other laudable achievements. All supported by, you know, a combination of luck, hard work, good people, <laughs> teams. Okay. There's a lot okay. that goes behind the success sometimes. True, yeah, true. So I'm a... But behind all that, Tosin sees herself as evolving. Tosin Jotwe is evolving. That's my answer. Ever since I started this journey when I moved back to Nigeria, I found that the easiest way to describe myself is to just say that I am evolving. And so when people say, what do you do? Who are you? I said, I'm evolving. So what that means for me is that 
I am approaching my life with a level of curiosity because the truth of the matter is that I know there's a plan. I do develop some of those plans. I do a visioning exercise, which I talk about all the time. Every year I envision what I want for myself. But I also realize that a great deal of it also has to do with just my destiny and what is sort of the path that I must walk. And um, that path, I think it's like a stairway. I am taking it a step at a time. I can never see the full stairway. I just know that I'm going up. And when I take one step, I put it in front of the other and I keep going. And I think as I go up the steps, I realize that I, I evolve along the way. So Tosin, of 2015 is not the same Tosin of 2000 mm. and well, almost 20 now. We've evolved, we've changed, we've tried new things. I've done things that I was scared to do and things that I would have never done in the past, I've tried them now. And so 2020, I'm looking forward to just discovering more about myself, more about my journey, my past, and who I'm going to need to be to fulfill my true purpose and my destiny. So. Okay. Evolving. Tosin grew up on Obafemi Awolowo campus in Ileife, Ocean State. She did taekwondo lessons, swam at the staff club, sang at the happiness club, and pretty much had an idyllic childhood. I loved uh-huh. growing up in Ife. At that time, and I don't know if it's still the same, but at that time, it was what I would call an idyllic childhood because Ife campus, which is where I grew up, so on OAU's campus, there you had, like you said, all kinds of activities for children, from swimming to taekwondo to the happiness club. Your school was right there on campus. You could walk to school, you know, staff school. You could go to Leventis at that time, buy snacks, then mm-hmm. go to the library after. You could ride your bicycle. All of this mm-hmm. morning, you are riding your bicycle. The people there know you because it's a small community. So mm-hmm. they know, ah, just say, be careful, though, eh? Just tell your mom I said hi, you know? So just growing up in that sort of idyllic way where you felt safe, you felt like everyone was truly your neighbor and in an environment that really nurtured children, at least in my case, I felt that I was surrounded by so many books, so many activities, so many, just so many things that I think really nurtured my mind um, at an early age. That's kind of what I remember about growing up in Ife. And it's, it's really been, it's been one of my favorite memories, you know, of my life is just Ife. I'll always honor Ife. However, Tosin wasn't always this courageous. She had her struggles growing up and was bullied. When she was six years old, her dad had gotten an appointment at the university in the US and they all moved to North Carolina, where she spent most of her formative years. Gosh, so I moved to North Carolina. I was I lived in North Carolina twice. Okay. And um, once I think I was around six and then I so I, I, I talk about it like a military thing like when you talk about tours okay. so my dad had a job in the US so we went there we were there for two years and then I came back again okay. one, and I was like eight or seven and something like that so I was there yeah how was the transition for you the new environment new friends culture you know was there racism children are resilient that's okay. what I'll just say but it's also not easy as a child um, because there's just a lot of culture shock and children are not always the kindest to one another. Um, I think adults, obviously, you know, we, we have our own issues, but adults tend to be a little bit more accommodating of foreigners, for example, or people that don't sound like them, for example. But I, in my case, we moved to North Carolina, which is a very, you know, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. It's a small town. Um, it's like the Ife equivalent of um, yeah. where you are. Okay. And so not a lot of people were exposed to immigrants or mm-hmm. people from different cultures, mm-hmm. you know, and that way is a southern town. And if you know anything about American South, it can be very... Um, you know, um, a certain way, Mm -hmm. you know, that's a certain way about it. And so when I moved there, I remember elementary school was okay because when kids are still very innocent, they are more curious. They're like, Mm -hmm. oh, where are you from? You're from Africa? Mm -hmm. 
can you speak your language? Oh, that's so cool. You know, like little six-year-olds, that's what they think. And, oh, I want you to meet my, you know. But then when you get into that sort of middle school, high school, when people are supposed to be cool and everybody has to click and are supposed to dress a certain way and sound a certain way, that was my second time around mm-hmm. moving back. And that was more difficult because then everybody has already formed alliances. Everybody has already formed their cliques. Everybody already is like, oh, no, this is my friend. And so you come in and your accent sounds one kind, according to them. You look different. You dress different. You know, I didn't know that back then, you know, in the South, in North Carolina, you had to, they were like, specific brand name shoes that you have to wear and jewelry. And, you know, there's, there's a thing just like here in Nigeria. I'm sure that in high school, there are some cool things that the cool kids know that, you know, when you move here, if, if you know, you know. If you don't know, then you're not cool. So just like everywhere else. But that's the thing with high school is that at that point, trying to fit in like most teenagers can be challenging, but then you're now layered on top of the fact that you're an immigrant. Mm-hmm. So they would ask you questions like, oh, you know, did you live in the huts? Did you play with monkeys? Is this your first time wearing clothes? And they're like, I'm sorry, what are you talking about? They're like, we know you don't wear clothes where you're from. Are you and serious? then I later realized, you know, after spending some time watching TV there, that that's what they see mm. or what their limited exposure has been is they see National Geographic, mm. they're watching people chase lions or something. I don't know. I was like, the only time I saw a lion was at the zoo. Mm. You know, but they, so it was a bit challenging, but like I said, with kids, you're resilient. And so I found my little corner. I adjusted slowly, but surely. And, um, you know, from there I went to college and college was a blast. Mm. That was probably my second favorite memory of my my life so far is how amazing college. So if it was amazing, college Mm. was amazing. Yeah. So high school, how were you able to cope through it? Coping through high school, for me, I've always been somebody, I think, because of the, um, you know, we'd moved to the U.S. before, we moved back to Nigeria. And by the way, there's also reverse culture shock. Mm -hmm. So I remember when we moved when I was like six and then my dad brought us back again. Then that time, you know, because kids, we adapt quickly. Kids adapt quickly. And so even in those two years... In living in the U.S., I'd already gotten... Because that's why you see kids, their accents can change like that. And it won't sound forced. Um, so by those two years, I'd already gotten used to the culture in the U.S., how we talk, how we do things. So by the time I came back, and my dad was like, we're going back to school more. I was like, oh, where? Yeah. To be fair. Ah, ah. Back to be fair. Ah. Like, what? You know, I've been eating apple. You know, eating grapes. Do you understand? Just eating anyhow. No, nobody is like cereal, hot ties. Mm. Ah, back to said, yes, that's, you know, the contract here. So I said, okay, fine. So when I came back, there was a shock mm. for that as well. Because mm. even though it was just two years, I remember coming back and all of a sudden, I didn't remember that they had corporal punishment. It was like, ah, I'm late, so I will kneel down. <laughs> So you can, then I'll put my hand like this so you can beat me with skin. I was just, because I mean, in America, they thought that was child abuse. So in two years, I'd already learned that you can't, it's not good to hit people. And I remember one time my mother was trying to beat me. And I told her that I was going to call Child Protective Services. <laughs> Because that's what they tell us in school. That we should that come. Abroad, in abroad now. Okay. So that's how quickly children just pick mm. up these things. Our parents will be like, oh, my dad, oh, I should say, what's America? What's the only cool? So I just was like, mom, if you touch me, I am going to call the police on you. Mm. And I was like, ah, this is a problem. Let me collect the phone for you. She brought the phone. She put it for me. I call. Call them. I was not looking at her. She was looking at me. We were looking at each other. She called them now. She was able to call police. So call them. You see, they will find you here when they are. Mm. So by the time, of course, I didn't call. I was scared. She brushed me nicely that day. So that day, I was like, okay, kids are changing. So by the time I came back, my perspective on so many things, even at that young age, I just kind of changed. And mm. I remember the first time when they beat, and they were doing, they used to do this thing called um, notebook check, where the principal, Mr. Jalaye, would just come in and she'd just be like, oh yeah, notebook check. And that just meant that she wanted to see how well you kept your exercise book, if the cover was torn or if it looked dead I was like, what's this? So I brought out this one child. I remember his cover had ripped or something like that. Ah, they said they wanted to cane this little boy. That's how the boy started doing marathon around the room. And as he was going around the room, I think he was just scared because he just started peeing. 
Are you serious? Yes, it was so traumatic. So me and I started crying. <laughs> so everybody was just like, ah. So the other kids were like, why is this one crying? I was just like, oh my god, oh my god, everybody help him. And everybody was like, I was this little girl say. Like, I was like, he's being abused. Oh my god, he's being on himself. Like, I was just so traumatized at the whole thing. Oh my gosh, guys, like, the shot finally caught him, Sha, the kid did well. I was like, okay, so that was reverse. So that was me coming back to my mm-hmm. own land and still feeling like I didn't recognize it all of a sudden. And so then I finally adjusted okay. in the years that we were there. And then my dad was like, oh, we're moving back again. Mm-hmm. So I was like, ah. another. so another time. And so this time around, because of my last experience, like I told you before, which was like, I was young, I was six, mm-hmm. elementary, kids are very nice, they're curious, mm-hmm. they want to be friends with mm-hmm. everybody. So I was going in there with the same mindset, like, oh, no problem, I'll just make friends, pick up where I left off. I remember playing, we were going back to the same town in North Carolina, so I was like, ah, no problem. But what I didn't consider was that now you're entering your teenage mm-hmm. years, that's completely different. Mm-hmm. And so... Me, I came in, I was like, okay, you know, what's up, guys? How far now? Mm-hmm. Everybody was just like, I'm sorry, but who are you? Where'd you come from? I was like, I'm from Nigeria. They're like, like Africa? I was like, yeah. They're like, mm, don't you guys have like diseases and stuff? Don't you have like, I was like, ah, wow. it's a different form. Wow. So that one, I had to just do that. So that was it. So it's been, so I think when you ask me, how do I adjust? I think. Mm-hmm. When you gotta go through it a couple of times, just like people that are in the military, you know, they call them in the US, they call them military brats, which is that every time their parents are relocated to new bases, mm-hmm. they move them around. So some of them are in Germany, then mm-hmm. they tell them they're moving to China. So as you grow like that, so after I have, I've done that a few times, it's difficult, but you also learn coping mechanisms of mm-hmm. just how to like adjust yourself to fit in. Do you and, have your esteem in any ways? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. But that's also then that you have to learn how to, like, grow your self-esteem. You know, and so I got bullied a lot. You know, like, I would talk in class. They'll tell me to keep quiet, that mm-hmm. nobody can understand me. You know, they'll tell me that, oh, you know, just, oh, you smell like Africa. Like, wow. even though I didn't, you know, like, things that... I will go home and I'll be asking my parents, like, is it true? Mm. Like, do I, you know, you know, they'll be like, I'm sure that your food smells. Like, just really mean, because mm. teenagers are very, they can be very mean true, true, and very, true. you know, that's why, like, even with these days with social media, we talk about social media bullying, young kids killing themselves over what their friends are putting on their comments or pictures that they're posting about them. I mean, you know, it's, teenagers can be very difficult in terms of how they you know, accept others, mm, mm. you know, because, and, and the thing is that it's just a form of insecurity because they're trying to fit in as well. Mm. And so they look for others that don't fit in to make them feel, you know, better. Mm. And so once I, so my parents were very instrumental in just sort of like supporting us and okay. so we'd come home, we'd be sad. It was very tough, but then my dad would be like, well, chin up, like, what's all this? Like, no, 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 yeah, no, you're good, you're smart, you're, you know, so all the positive reinforcement affirmations, which is why parenting and family is so important. I, my dad and I were just actually talking about it the other day, and my dad was like, listen, I'm just so happy that social media wasn't a thing when you guys were coming up, because imagine, it's like, I remember you coming home crying, being bullied, and then imagine if on your phone there's another person that's now tagging you on one mm. social mm. media, like, look at this African girl, <laughs> you know, like, it would just compound. So at least when I came home in those days, I would leave the stuff at school. And I have to deal with it when I go back. And my dad would say, if somebody harasses you, to harass them back. If they abuse you, abuse them back. Like, don't just go there and be crying and looking weak. And so, all of a sudden, I learned to just toughen to toughen up. You just gotta toughen up, and your skin's gotta, you know, get a little bit tougher. Mm. And so, I just learned that. And so, after a while, I realized that okay, what works with teenagers is that if somebody's speaking on you, you turn to them and you're like, okay, you want to do that? All right, then let's do that. Okay, so you want to talk about my clothes? How about your shoes? Your shoes look like they haven't been cleaned in ten days. And all of a sudden, they're just like, oh. Oh, she's not going to just, you know, so all of a sudden I cracked the code oh, okay. and I realized that, you know what, sometimes it takes a you know bully to fight a bully and I'm not a bully, but if you come for me, I'm going to be like, all right, how far? Let's do this, you know, and, and then you find that people that are bullies, it's like I said, insecurity because they True. back down. True. And so when they see that you two, you have some 
you know, inside of you, so I need to do like, ah, no, we don't want this one. But they pick on the weak people. That's what's so sad about it. So once you show that you're not weak, then they back down. Tosin also hated how tall she was growing up, so she always hid her legs. Um, yeah, I didn't like my legs. Was this in high school or it was in college? High school, mostly. Okay. I mean, shorts are still not my favorite item. I don't okay. like shorts. I'm like, why? Why, mm-hmm. why would anybody wear those? But that's just me. For me, I think mm-hmm. it's good for other people. Just for me, I'm like, mm-hmm. I'm all legs, like most of my body's legs. And so when I was growing up, because obviously before I even added the small which I have now, like I said, I'm like a pencil. So mm-hmm. back then, I just really, really had like insecurities about my legs. And now I love my legs, you know? And like, I think that's the thing again. And I mentor girls, I mentor young girls now. And the way that I can tell you these stories vividly, and the way that I can reflect on this is the reason why I can mentor young people because mm. it still feels like yesterday. I understand the struggles. I understand not being happy in your body or wishing you were a different way or being bullied or being insecure. Like I just, I remember all of those things because, and I maybe because the reason, first of all, I have a very sharp memory. But secondly, I think when you are a child of immigrants, like back and forth like that, the memory is sharper, mm, you know, it, mm. it's not a blur, it's sharp. So I, I know when we move back, I remember mm. the square, I remember, I remember, the t- I remember so many details mm. till today. And so mm. that's why I connect so much with young people because I understand them. I'm mm. like, I understand what you're saying, you mm. know, when they're like, oh, I was bullied. I'm like, oh, you know, mm. it's like, it's like, I, I can, can still empathize. feel it. I can still empathize with them. You know, when they tell me things like, you know, I'm feeling this way, I'm feeling that way, I'm feeling pressure to do this and that, I, I remember everything. And so that's part of my passion and my purpose mm. in this life is to continue to be for them who I wish I had. Mm. And I mean, I had it, thankfully, in my parents, but not everybody has that. So I want to be that woman for young people Um that don't have that affirmation at home, that don't have that positive reinforcement or that go out there and be confident, don't let them bully you. Mm-hmm. Don't go and fight. So I didn't have to go and fight. I didn't have to go and fight. But yes, don't let people shrink you down. Don't let bullies take away your voice. Don't let bullies take away the space that you occupy. You belong like every other human being. You belong here. You belong in any room you find yourself in any space you are meant to be there and you must act as such so which parent had the greater influence on you both to be honest in different ways in different ways you know my mother um was very instrumental sort of in our ekwakiko is that the quality that you but just making sure that we never you know, we never got comfortable enough where, like, I remember moving to Lagos and I was still cool for people that I would later mm, find out okay. at my age. Mm. But I just thought it's safer to do that than to not show respect to somebody that might be older than me. I mean, that was just how my mom was, like, very traditional in that way. And so she really instilled, like, traditional values in me. And my dad did as well. I was just telling some of my colleagues today that Yoruba is actually my first language. English is my second. Mm. So I didn't learn English until I was like, I don't know, when I started school. Because oh, okay. my father's whole thing was that his job is not to teach me the colonial master's language. That he said, I'm not a colonialist. So why would I cho- teach my children English? Like my language is Yoruba. That's what they would learn. And so we all learned Yoruba in the house. And so my dad obviously had his own influence. My mom had her own influence. Um, my dad, I would say that his influence has been striking in my life because I think you expect, at least for me as a woman, I expect a relationship with my mother. That's sort of like mm-hmm. a natural thing. But I also know that not everybody has a close relationship with their father, especially women. I thought girls were closer to their dad. Sometimes I think, but it also depends on what you mean by close. Is it just like spoiling them or is it like being like a friend? Mm-hmm. You know, like, so I think sometimes, like, fathers obviously will spoil their daughters. Ah, my daughter, my daughter. But, like, my father is, like, my friend. Like, mm. he... I, there's nothing I can't talk to him about. There's, like, I can't think of anything that I can't mm. talk to my dad about. Everything from dating to career to decisions that I need to make to spiritual matter. Like, there's nothing that I can't go to that man about. He's a very wise man. Mm. And so our relationship, for me, you know, when I look around appears unique to me but I could just be biased but you know I really do feel that he did a lot 
and just making sure that we saw him, you know, as a father, but really truly as a friend. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, so love okay. both of them. Okay. Yeah. Take it into college. How did you decide on your first degree? Okay, well, so my dad, speaking of him, wanted me to, um, like most African parents, wanted me to do one of three things or four things at the time. All of you listening probably know who, what those things are. I think it's doctor, <laughs> lawyer, engineer, or accountant. Mm. So I said, okay, I'll do the business routes, go and get my MBA. And, you know, so I started with accounting. And at the time, I knew I didn't want to do it. I really was, I don't like numbers like that. I'm not like excited by it. Mm. And I just, I was, I wanted to do something more freeing and, you know, like that. And my dad was like, I beg you can't do business degree so you can't get good good job mm. when you get out. Like, you know, something that's marketable and, you know, the usual Nigerian parent thing. So I was like feeling pressured. And so I did it. And let me just tell you that to this day, it's been the worst grade of my entire academic career. Was that accounting course? Yes, mm. definitely. Yes, I remember. It was a very humbling experience because up until then, I was like a very good student, mm. you know. But that class, eh? Hey, accounting 101. I was like, I'm sorry, what? what? <laughs> Say that again. I was like, yeah, say, some receivable is doing what? I was like, <laughs> I was like and then is the number that depreciating what? I was just in the class, I was confused. And so when my grade found, and I thought I was going to at least pass, like, mm. and the grade came out, and I was like, eh? And then I went home. I had to go home because my father is Who very. Was an F? No, it was a D. Well, it's not be an F in the family, mm. Nigerian household now. It's an F now. What's the G? What's that? G. Uh, G. What's, the, what's, what's the difference between C, D, and F? It's the same thing. So that's how I was like, okay, my God, I had to go home. So now I go home. And I was like, go and bring your grades. Ah, Jesus. I brought the grades and he was fucking, he was upset. Mm. And my father is a very level headed man. Mm. He's very calm. But ah, when it came to grades, my behavior, like there's some things that make my dad upset. So that one I knew that he didn't play with that grades. Mm. So I didn't know what to do. No, I never came. No, I that's rough. No, that's rough. So when he started shouting, I just did when he was I was like, Dad, I did this because of you. I did this. I did this because you wanted me to. It was all because of you. I wanted to make you proud. I just like crying. <laughs> The guy was confused. It was the confusion was clear. He was like, ah. I was like, I did it. I loved you. I loved you. That's why I have a D. And he just was like, you know what? You just chat like, so go 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 and do what you want because mm. I'm not going to be. You know, my dad is a reasonable man. Mm. That's why I love him as well. So he's reasonable in the sense that yes, he had the Nigerian approach at first, which mm. was I want you guys to do X Y Z. But when he realized that this thing was actually like stressing mm. me out and making me sad, and I was like obviously not doing well he was like you know what fine do what you want to do but whatever you choose you must get excellent grades like i don't care but you must get excellent grades and so i decided i was going to study politics and that's what he was a professor in so i was curious and I was about he couldn't to say anything <laughs> i'm like i'm going to study what you studied and he was like him being a professor in any way influence your decision no i just always loved i mean well probably in some subconscious way because i was always around my dad listening to them talk about politics my dad is a he's a political scientist that's what his phd is in and so he's always been we've always been surrounded by books and i knew about when Car- ken sarawiwa died for example mm-hmm. we're no longer allowed to buy shell oil in my house even in america so mm-hmm. if we were driving my father would say keep driving until you sell that guy we're not buying shell so that was like a protest in my heart mm-hmm. in my own house so my father's always been an activist like i um, people don't know this part of the story but like he used to uh, i protest against apartheid that got him in trouble with the fbi in the mm-hmm. u.s back then so my father's always been very conscious a bit of a radical so for me, politics was always something I was fascinated mm. by. And okay. so I already knew that, okay, I, I would be really, and I, I love just learning about different, you know, sort of states, countries and stuff like that. So I did that and he was like, okay, that's fine. And then I was like, and I'm going to do studio art. Mm. And he just was like, oh, go, go. Mm. it's okay, I'm going to graduate school. So that's a good thing about the US that I like is that it's not like the UK system where they make kids, I feel, lock into something 
with like their A-levels. I think that's what I've understood mm. from my mentees. Am I right? Like that you go in, you declare like a subject matter and I'm like, you're 17. Yeah, you don't even, mm. you haven't, all, you haven't thought through all. life or like how can they make you, you know. And so the U.S., what I love about it is that they have, you know, there's a liberal arts system, you know, so some colleges are liberal arts, which means that they allow you to explore different subject matters. So they just tell you that, okay, you have two years to declare your major. In the meantime, these are the only prerequisites that we're giving you. So you mm. must take your calculus class, you must take your language class, you must, like, they'll give you like, you know, a list of things that mm-hmm. you must take. But everything else is open. I think in Nigeria, you. it makes something like that. It's open. And so I got to explore and I got to, I did a, a language course and then I did like my um, communications course and I did politics and then I did an art class and I did you know so I was just like trying different things to see what I liked and then when I realized that I, you know I loved painting and I actually was a really good painter I just stopped because of life but I probably you know at some point I hope to go back to that okay. later on in my life but I, I, I majored in art so that was my second you know sort of I was one class away I think from like a major but um, I wanted to graduate early for some reason. I don't know why I had this idea, ethical, that I must graduate college early. I don't know why, because there's nothing outside in this real world. Listeners, there's nothing outside here but bills and responsibilities. So I don't know what was rushing me. But at that time, I just was like, oh, you know what? I'm just going to graduate early, everything. And so every summer, I will be there taking extra classes. Instead of me to go and enjoy my life, I was taking courses. And yes, I did graduate in three years instead mm-hmm. of four. Okay. But... The, Nobody asked me that when I interviewed for a job. Nobody cares. Nobody's like, yeah. so like oh, wow, you only, you only did three years ago. I, no one cared. So I could have just, uh, just taken my mm. sweet time and really just, you know, because life is short. And once that moment passes, you can't go back, you know. So just savor it. Savor whatever moment you're in in life now. And that goes for everything. Single, married, don't have a kid, married, have a kid. Whatever moment you're in, savor it. Rejoice in it because trust me, the next thing will come. And once that next thing comes, there's no way to hit reverse mm. to go back to that mm. old thing. So, mm. but you know, the good thing I did is that during that time that I had, that I wasn't in school because I graduated early, I just traveled. I went to China okay. and I just, you know, that my love of travel has always been mm. there. So I'm almost at like 50 countries now. And so, and so for me, I just wanted to travel. And so I did some of that, hung out. I just chilled. And I think, now that I look back at my life as I'm talking, I think now I realize that I, maybe I do this thing a lot, actually, and I did realize it, is that maybe secretly I'm actually more of a free spirit and I haven't agreed to that yet. Mm-hmm. But every chance I get to take a break, I do. I do. So in the past three years, I think I've probably taken like two or three. <laughs> so that's like people ask me, like, so I'm always, I'm, I'm always working in some mm-hmm. capacity, either as a consultant or as COO here mm-hmm. or as director there. <laughs> But there are also times when, you know, if I decide like, oh, there's another opportunity I want to pursue, I'm not afraid. Mm. Um, I'm not afraid to just try it and see what happens. Were there any other jobs you did while screening? Oh, wow. Yes. So I didn't like to take money from my parents. I just don't know why. Because they used to think I was weird. Like, what child doesn't want money? But I just didn't like the idea. I just felt like... I needed to make my own money and I don't want anybody asking me what I'm doing with my money. And this was me from when I was like 14 years old for some weird reason. Like, why? I don't know. So I told my parents that I wanted to get a job. And my dad was like, you're too young. And I was like, okay, so when can I get a job? They're like, ah, what do you need money for? I was like, things. I don't know the things though. These things I'm talking about, maybe hair clip, maybe chewing gum. I don't, I try to take my own money. That's all I knew. And so, the first job I had at 14 or 15 was I I went and did a training at the Red Cross okay. and I got a babysitter's license. So mm. I now did, I remember I did, I used to read a book called Babysitter's Club. So I now decided that, okay, I'll start doing babysitting in the neighborhood. Mm. And you know what? It worked. I, I had some clients, you know, so I was making, you know, $40 here and there. And for like a 15-year-old, that was not bad because what are you sure. spending money on? It's not like I paid anything in the house. So I had $40, you know, I could go to the mall, buy little things for $1 mm-hmm. here. So that was helpful. And then the minute I became 16 and I could legally work in the U.S., I told my dad, I was like, Dad, please, please, can I get a job? And he was like, go and read your book. You know, that's when I joined. Mm-hmm. I said, go and read your book. And I was like, no, please. So we now agreed that, okay, I could work on the weekends. Okay. And then in some cases, I could work in the evening. Mm-hmm like maybe one evening out of the week. Mm-hmm. But work, uh, school work had to come first. Right? Mm-hmm. So we agreed. So I was working at the grocery store. 
And there I was bagging groceries. I was so excited. I'll be at the end, like plastic or paper. And <laughs> I was just so happy to be there. I was like, oh my God, I'm making money. So I was plastic paper. Ah, I was, the fact that I had it. I had a system mm. to bag in things, box the bottle, eggs side. I had, I had a whole system, so they'd be in and out. They liked me as a bagger. And then mm. one day they were like, ah, that they would promote me to cashier. Yeah. I was like, wow, I'm a cashier at the grocery store. So I was excited. And ah, in fact, my cashiering, mm, I'd be counting the money 10, 10 times, like make sure my money is there. Because if you don't have money, if your money is not correct in the Cash till at the end. Are you treating like numbers in accounting? No, but you I am not. That's different. That's different. I like counting money. So, so I did that, and then from there, honestly, I've not stopped having a job since then. Walk us through your career journey briefly since when you completed okay, your Okay, so I got my first degree, and I was going to go and find myself in New Orleans, and. Um, I got into a program called Teach for America. So I wanted to go and teach at a low income school and help kids out. I've always had this thing of public service. So it's who I am. So even when I was in college, I was volunteering. I've been teaching at the Red Cross, even from high school. I was teaching there until maybe four years ago mm-hmm. as a side hustle. Like everybody was like, I don't understand. So you have a corporate job. Why are you still doing it? I was like, try and leave me. I like it. I like teaching at the Red Cross. And they used to even pay me. So it wasn't a bad deal. So I just, I liked it. So I did it for like 18 years almost. Um, but yeah, so after my first degree, I tried to get away to go to New Orleans where I was going to teach. And I got into this very competitive program okay. for new graduates. And my dad said, I'm going to do what? I said, teach for America. My father said, you are not teaching for America, you are not teaching for Africa, you are not teaching for China. You are going to graduate school, you are going to get your master's. And I was like, no, dad, I need time mm. to discover myself. Mm. I need to find myself. And he was like, where did you place yourself? Did you misplace yourself? <laughs> got to find this because they are going right now, now, now. So, so like I said, my dad is flexible in many ways, but there are just some things that I just knew that, mm. you know, and that was one of the agreements that okay. we made with, with all of us is that we all had to get our second degrees. So I went from college to NYU, and it was actually a blessing. Um, God has been very deliberate in my life, I'm thankful, um, because at that time, I remember being so stressed out and being like, I have not even taken my entrance exams. I don't even know what I'm going to graduate school for. This man is stressing my life. Like, why? But he just was like, figure it out. And so I remember that day, one of our family friends came over, and that woman was one of my first mentees, Mrs. Deborah Holmes. And she used to always talk about her job and how she loved it and, oh, we're doing this amazing. So I just said to her and I said, well, what, what do you do? Like, you sound like you like it. And she was like, oh, I'm a city planner. And I was like, city planning, what's that? I've never heard of that. And so I Googled it and I was amazed because for somebody like me, who likes to figure out ways to make an impact, like city planning was one of those things, at least in the US where it allowed you to do that. So when I saw the course and I looked at the curricula in all the different colleges, there was things like economic development, affordable housing development, transportation, um, you know, things that affect people's like lives, you know, and even education is under, you know, urban planning, where you put schools and, where you, you know, that kind of thing, mm-hmm. libraries. Yeah. So city planning essentially is what it says, how you plan out cities. Mm-hmm. And so where does the struggle go? So for example, Lekki is not well planned. I'll tell you that for free because I can tell you that, you know, if I was a city planner, Lekki should have been kind of what Oniru is right now, which is purely residential for the most part. We have some schools here and there. But if you look at the road network, it's clear that it wasn't meant for commercial, a commercial uh, hub, which is what it has become. And so you have these roads like Admiralty now. Look at all those stores and you just have one lane like maybe two that are just little residents and shopping and now you know and so in the u.s you're not allowed to do that you're zoned so they'll tell you this place is zoned residential which means that nobody can pay anything to put any commercial there and so you can keep the roads the same because it's meant just for residents but then when you are talking commercial then you must then build in your transportation plan into that to say okay how many more people are we now expecting in this area because of the shops 
whatever that number is, we must then build the roads that will accommodate both the residents. And, you know, so those are the kinds of things that city planning mm, mm. does. So for me, it was like, I saw it and I was like, that's it. Mm. And if it wasn't for this woman that just came that particular day that I was so stressed out because my father said that he doesn't care, she can't figure it out. That woman was like, and that woman went on to find me an internship. Okay. My very first paid internship. So oh, wow. I moved to New York. I got a scholarship at NYU, which I wasn't. No one gets a scholarship at New York University. New York University is it's hard because number one, getting in. Number two, it's an expensive. New York City is one of the most expensive cities in the U.S. So, mm-hmm. like you have to think about housing, cost of transportation, food. Like everything is mm-hmm. a lot, and so. I applied to a bunch of schools for city planning and I was thinking, oh, I don't know. But again, because God always has a role to play in everything. Um, He was like, you're going to NYU. And I remember looking back at my life a few years ago and I thought, gosh, what better city to have studied city planning than New York City? I mean, what other city would it have been where I could see or everything we studied in class is like I would go outside and I would That's see it like it was like a lab like living inside the lab because it's one of the biggest cities you know in the world the most active mm-hmm. you know and so I got a scholarship and that was amazing and then from that point on you know me i have never not having a job so even then I was looking my father told me to make him a promise that my first semester I would not work. I said, okay, okay. fine. He said, just please, just go there and just adjust first to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Coming from Abule, North Carolina. Go and just settle down, figure out New York, and then you can start working. Mm. I was like, that's the semester's lost loss of which is was okay. My father was like, is it is the money that you need? You don't need money, you have money. I said, okay, fine. So I didn't work for one semester. But the minute Second semester, he's, uh, uh, of course, I was already back at it. I think I got internships at New York City government. I never worked for free. I always got paid. And so... Was it deliberate? Yes. I always only interview for internships where I'll get paid. And so I did that. And then during the summer, I would then do two internships. So I would be working in the morning to early afternoon, then from afternoon to evening. So... <laughs> so man like at you know. So I just everybody was like, oh, I'm with this people. She has scholarship. You know, the appearance mm-hmm. I think, but I just like to just and so even my scholarship, like my parents never had to pay anything because I just I paid my rent, I paid like I just that, I don't know, I just that's always been my work ethic. And so after I graduated, one of the professors there interviewed me and um wanted me to come and work for him, and I was like, wow. And the offer, the salary at the time was like, for a new graduate, I was like, what? Mm. And the guy was like, yes, can you start in one month or so? I was like, no problem. So I moved to DC. Okay. And that's where I was for about 10 years. Mm. And I worked there, I worked, I worked uh, for a consulting firm. Um, then from there, I ended up working for an NGO that was founded by the US Congress. So essentially working for governments, but they had like a CSR thing. Mm. Um, and so I did that for almost a decade. I was there for like eight years. Okay. And it was an amazing, that's really where I think I honed my professional mm-hmm. skill sets, was working under the woman that I worked for. She was, she pushed me and um, she wasn't easy, but I appreciate that because mm-hmm. that was the way I grew, mm-hmm. is that she always demanded the best. and. And I just had to learn how to deliver the best. And so working with her was really, really a blessing. She still sends me happy birthday every year. Wow. I think that's amazing. I've been I've been away from her now for gosh, it must have been like four years now. Mm. You know, but we're still in touch. And so that was my career journey. And then one day I woke up and I realized I'd been there for ten years and I was like, geez, is this like I just thought something in my spirit was unsettled. Mm. Like I don't know, it could have been because Trump got into office. That definitely has something to do for it, for sure, for sure. When the Chito and the Dorito man got into office. But once he did that, there was something inside of me. And I think maybe as an immigrant where I just was like, <laughs> I beg you, Joe, I asked to go to that place other than this America self, you know, like after 20 something years, you just look around and you're like, is this it? Like, there's, mm-hmm. I have, there's more in me. Mm-hmm. And the atmosphere, when Obama was there, I think he gave a lot of people, including myself, this, I mean, it's amazing what leadership can do. 
in small and big spaces. So leadership in the workplace, leadership in your family, but even leadership of a country, it trickles down to the people and their psyche, how they see themselves, how they think. And that's why we talk about how Nigeria has a long way to go. Because if your leaders are models and people that you look up to and you admire, it makes you feel like, yeah, let's do this. You know, all of a sudden it just inspires you. So under Obama, I was inspired. I was thinking like, I could be here for a long time. Just this sky was just like the limit in my mind because we have a black president, like, oh my gosh, you know, that's a big deal in America. So when Trump got into office, I think it was just like a cold shower. Everybody was just like, wait, what's going on? And it was just a shock. And so for me, that shock, I think, was part of what also kind of woke me up from sort of my comfort zone, which is where I was. I was in a very big comfort zone. I was very comfortable, like there was nothing doing me. But I just was like, I have to do more. Like, so Obama is gone. And so what now? Like, what am I supposed to do? And I just felt like I need to do something. I don't know why I felt that way, but I just felt like I had to shake myself up and I had to wake up and do something. And so initially I had this crazy dream of, I talk all the time, like, initially I was like, oh, I'm going to go to Europe. Yes. I'm going to go to Paris. Yes. I'm going to learn French. Mm. I'm, decide, I'm just going to start my life over. Like, mm. Like I said, I'm that kind of person that I think now that I look back, I'm realizing that I do this thing often where I'll just like uproot, I just mm-hmm. like switch it up, you know? And I think maybe that's because of my upbringing as well. Going back and forth, mm-hmm. I just realized mm-hmm. that I think I'm now just used, to, mm-hmm. like it doesn't scare, it scares me, but not in the way that I feel like it's not doable. Like mm-hmm. I'm always, like if somebody tells me now that I should come and move to like Thai, Thailand, I'll just be like, okay, when? Like I, I, you know, I'll be scared. Like, but you do it. But I'll still do it because that's what I do. So when I was like, okay, I'll go to Paris. I just started thinking about Paris, and I was looking at like visas and like, okay, what would I need to do to get a job there? And then I'll learn a new language. I just, just start life, a new life. And I started looking, and then one day, and I won't say like it was a voice, you know, but it was definitely something that popped in my head from mm-hmm. nowhere, and it was like. Or you could just move back to Nigeria, your country. Remember? You have your passport. You don't need a visa. And I was like, eh? Who said that? <laughs> that so to so today, I still joke that it must be my village people that were calling me back. Because I don't understand. Because I, in my mind, I told myself that I would never move back. Mm. And why was that? I wasn't at the part of my journey yet where God wanted me to do that. That's why. Whenever God is ready for you to do something, things will start to change energies will start to shift, mm. you start to attract, your mindset will start to move. There are things that just happen that let you know that it's time. And the question then is, are you ready for it? Are you ready to take that leap? You know, mm-hmm. but at that time, I remember my concerns were things like traffic, lights, mosquitoes. I just thought Nigeria was so hectic. I was like, I can never move back there. My father was like, ah, move down. Because my father's thing, when we moved to the US, was that like, he told me when I was however old, a child, he said, when I'm leaving, you know, all you people are coming back with me. And I remember looking at this man like, when oh, you are leaving, do you know what my life would look like then? How can you just tell me that I'll move back? Mm-hmm. In my mind, I was like, I'll be married, I'll have kids, like, bad boy, like, I'll be gone. But God has plans. And you know what? That man, his mouth to God's ears because the day I, so when I got the idea, I thought the idea was crazy. I was like, this is a crazy idea, but you know what? I'm going to confirm that it's crazy because I want to tell my parents and they're going to say, that is a crazy idea. Mm. Do you see what's going on in Nigeria? You have a good job here. What are you looking for? Mm. And I went to tell them and my dad was like, fantastic idea. I like it. And I was like, (laughs) I said I was going to move to Nigeria and I'm going to quit my job. That's what I said. And he was like, I heard you. I think it's a great idea. Ah. He looked at my mom. My mom was like, hey now, Yes, now. Ah, it's a dad. Man, I won't call one bit. I was like, you know what? That's not what we're talking about right now, but okay, well. So, um, and my dad's thinking was very clear and I understood because I think, you know, my dad uh, went to school in the U.S. as well. Mm-hmm. So he got his master's and his PhD in the U.S. So he was there for many years. So I have uncles and aunties that are African-Americans. My father is that kind of guy. Mm-hmm. His friends with whoever he meets, says, those are his friends. And okay. so he made friends, you know, and so my father kind of grew up there as well. But he said one of the pivotal moments in his life was when he said that one day he was just in America walking around and he was like, what do you mean? What am I doing here? It's almost like identical to what happened to me. Like he just was like, he was at a shopping mall and he was just like looking at people walking by and I was like, I don't know. 
kids anymore shame be like he just had a moment because at that time believe it or not naira was actually stronger than the dollar mm-hmm. so he was like ah and they offered me a job in ife and my salary would be more than i'm making in america at that time so that's how my dad just packed up all his stuff for body one way to get put everything into storage units and came back to nigeria and i saw it because when we moved back to the us he took us back to the storage units and that storage unit looked like it was frozen in the 70s like lava lamps bean bags oh, like wow. all his fellow records were still there like literally this man just took all his stuff dumped it locked the gates and went back sure. to nigeria and did not come back for decades mm-hmm. and he was paying the money on for the yeah that was mm-hmm. it and so i think he saw he must have seen part of that in me was why he wasn't scared because i told me he said that it was a good decision because he said when he got to nigeria it allowed him to reconnect with all his friends from high school you know from ui he invested his money here you know with the state so so he was able to make some decisions so even when he went back to america now he's retired my dad just moved back seamlessly mm-hmm. seamlessly there was no story the guy he already knows where he's going he already has his house there his friends are here he knows the people like cuz he knew he has friends that they arrived there in the 70s and they are still there today they never came back and so for them it's hard for them to know how to come back home sure. they don't they didn't think to invest in land or real estate or come back and reconnect they've lost touch with their friends they you know, they know it, it can be very like i said reverse culture shock can happen so now they're probably going to be in america for ever but my dad was like go and even if you come back it's okay but at least at this point in your life just go learn the lay of the land invest some of your money reconnect with some friends make new friends have a work experience you know go and if you want to come back at least you will know your way back later on in your life you won't say that ah i have i haven't been in nigeria since the 80s you won't say that you know and i thought that was a good point that he made and so that was all but even then no i still went on a crusade asking people i was like you people hey this i this in nigeria i should get uh, something is i should come people mm-hmm. and they were like everybody like i said it was like ordained because mm-hmm. everyone was just i mean there was one day i even met a guy at a bar and the guy just sat next to me and he was like so well, you know hey and i was like hey i was waiting on my friend and i was like i'm waiting on my friend you know because guys and you know, i was like mm-hmm. and the guy was just so cool he was like oh so what do you do i was like oh you know i work in you know kind of government you know us government and stuff and but I'm thinking of moving on I think I should go to Nigeria cuz I think it's an amazing idea I think you should do it. Oh, you He's like I just, just did it. Like He's like I just did it. It's like I quit my job and I moved and it was the best decision I ever made. Like the guy was like almost like as if somebody sent him. You know what I mean? Like I don't know you and you're just here you're telling me that yes this thing you must do it and I was like okay you know and so he was like promise me you know like it was so strange yeah and it was just one of many signs like that that were happening and there were some other personal things that were happening around that time for me too that just gave me the sign that okay you know what it's time to make the leap but even then I told God I said you know listen <laughs> I'm a risk taker you know this thing so this idea that you planted is for you to now build the bridge in just a moment Tosin will be talking about how she took that leap and returned to Nigeria. Don't go anywhere. I'm Oshaye and you're listening to Origins Africa podcast. Hi, dear listener. If you love our show, please leave us a review on iTunes and Apple Podcast. You can also send us a tweet or comment on Instagram at Origins AF. We love to read from you. Nope, not later. Yes, I read your mind. Do it now. Thanks a lot. Also click the subscribe button and share with a friend. Let's make a difference together, one origin story at a time. Hi guys, welcome back to Origins Africa podcast. It's 2012. And Tosi had taken a leave of absence to come to Nigeria for three months due to personal reasons. So I I, I was in the U uh, in Nigeria for a few months uh, for some personal reasons. I had to take a leave of absence, okay. so I came to Nigeria instead. And when I came, um, again, all in alignment with God's plan, I think, because actually I probably shouldn't have been here for that long, but just at that moment I had the time. So I came for three months, 
And while I was here, it was outside of Christmas season. So for the first time, I got to see Nigeria like mm. on a regular day, what it's like. And somehow my mind had shifted, you know, because that's what happens when God is trying to align you with something he's doing, mm. is that he'll just, the things that you used to see before, you just won't see them again. Mm. So all of a sudden, the traffic that used to be like, ah, this traffic, yeah, it was bad, but I remember, I was thinking, okay, you know, it's not that bad. Maybe there's Uber, there's drivers, there's, you know, all of a sudden my mindset was just, I was like, ah, oh, lights, it's not, it's not, but then you get to the place where there's lights now. Simple. You know, all of a sudden, uh, it was weird. And I was the last person that my father thought would move because I was the first one to say I can never move. So when I now said to him, he was just like, it's going to change her mind, don't worry, she's just having a moment. So when I now came back, he was like, eh. I was like, I loved it. I want to go back, you know? And he was like, oh, okay, so what's the plan? I was like, I don't know. I don't know the plan, but I'm going to do it. And um, I was scared, you know? But the thing with fear that I've learned over the years is that uh, you live with it. It never goes away. Um, it visits, I should say. It goes away, but it visits. It visits. And when it visits, it's okay. But you must just tell yourself that the fear cannot move in, cannot set up shop, you cannot take your extra bedroom. Because mm. if you live with fear like that, then you'll never do anything. You know, and so for me, I was scared, but I always would do it in spite of it. So what I found in this journey is that the net always appears. The net is just, phew. and so I always leap. And when I leap the net, so I leaped. And what did I do? I didn't really leap like that. Too. What I did was that I wrote a resignation letter. And I love my boss so much. I didn't want to leave her, I have to be honest. But I was like, I have to follow this dream that's in my heart now, you know. But I just told God, I said, God, you have to make this day easier for me because I just can't show up in Nigeria with no job now. Like, I don't even know what's there. Like, I was like, okay, I could do my, because I've always had like a consulting firm. So I've done consulting for the past nine years in addition to my full time. Like I said, I'm a good girl. <laughs> so, you know, I do many different things. And so I was like, okay, I'll just continue my consultation here. But I don't know, I just felt like, mm, I don't know. I don't know if I want to enter the market having mm. to look for contracts and stuff like that. So anyway, long story short, let me just tell you, let me just cut the story short. But that's how I shall got a job randomly okay. that somebody sent to my inbox. And the person didn't even know I was moving or thinking of moving. They just said, we're looking to hire some people for this tech company. And I'd already started doing tech mm. at the government job. So I was already in tech. And so when I got this thing, I thought, ah, oh, this is the kind of job I would want to. If I was staying here, I would take this job. Or, I must stay here and go to Nigeria. Mm-hmm. Someone just told me, reply to them and just say, I would love this job, but I'm thinking of moving. Sorry, but I'll pass it around, you know, let other people know. And the person was like, so soon. We were hoping you would respond. We were waiting on your response, mm-hmm. even though the email was a blast. So I was like, what does she mean? She was like, yeah, we were hoping you would respond because we really want you to join our team. So I was like, ah. No, if you read the email, if you see, it says that I'm thinking of going back to Nigeria. And she was like, no, we saw it. Yeah. Let's talk about it. Anyway, also, that's why I came here with that job, Interesting. Interesting. So when I say that the God, the universe, whatever you call it, conspired, there's a quote in one of my favorite books, you know, um, and in that book, it talks about how the universe will conspire with you if you set your intentions. And I've exercised that now for seven years straight, and it has worked like a charm. Um, when people talk about visioning and vision boards, um, I do it every year, um, but I do it in a way that's very, very deliberate. So I see a lot of different things happening. People think it's just about cutting magazine and pasting the board. It's not about that. My visioning process, if I take people through it, it takes about eight hours because it's the same way how you told me you work for a company where you're part of the strategic planning team. You sit down, you talk about goals, strategy, how do we get there? What is our KPI for this? What's this exactly. is not what you do, exactly. but we don't do that for our lives. We just flow. We just, eh, let's see what the year. No, you must be deliberate and you must, and it's not to say that everything will be in your control, but you must set the plan. You must at least have a plan. And that plan will then tell you what to say yes or no to. If you know that your goal is to save, let's just say, this amount of money this year, and you put that goal down and you put it somewhere where you see it every day, trust me, when somebody says, yeah, Take your money and let's go and buy a show be for Kinecon. You say, ah, well, I'm on English be my wall. And you divert that money. Because you see that there's a goal. It's the same as your company. You have a KPI. You must reach KPI. Same thing, you must reach your own personal KPIs. 
for your own life. But what I found that's even more amazing is that when you do that, yeah, even the things that are not in your control mm. begin to appear. Mm. Interesting. So this, so I set the intentions by writing this resignation letter. I said, I'm going to leave because I'm going to Nigeria. I've agreed. I'm in agreement mm -hmm. with my purpose. Yes, we move. How? I don't know. But I have set it and it is in plan. It is in motion. I will just wait to see what I will say yes to. So when that offer came and I saw something about remote possible, rather than saying, you know, maybe if I hadn't thought about my plan for that year, I may have thought, mm, I'm going, this job is for America. But because the back of my brain was saying, but you know, what will help you is that if you had a job from America, that thing will really help. Remember that plan that you have to go to Nigeria? So email, reply. And so from that reply, so the job that came to me, that was not my own doing. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Yes, my reputation professionally was there. That's why they were hoping that I would reply. But still, the timing of it, mm -hmm. I cannot take ownership of that. That's why when, when I talk about success, I, I can't take ownership for the mm -hmm. whole thing. And so that job came to me for a reason. I replied for a reason. They said yes to me doing it from Nigeria mm -hmm. for a reason. Mm -hmm. It was all just part of me saying, this is the plan I have. And then from that point on, what happens is that you attract enablers, mm -hmm. destiny helpers. Mm -hmm. And I've done this thing every year. Mm -hmm. And every year it happens. Every year. And I wish more people could lock into this thing. Because once you understand how this thing works, this world, this life, God, universe, mm -hmm. and it's still mysterious to me. But all I know is that whenever I am in alignment and whenever I state and I walk, walk in that that alignment, that path, everything I need is provided for me. It's almost like I don't lift a finger, it's in just... But how become. do people, or how can people know that they're in alignment? Oh, because the signs are there. So like I told you, when the plan to move came, it wasn't me that, I was me, I was doing Paris now. Paris didn't mean one thing. Mm -hmm. You know, je parle français. Understand? But then the thing came into my head. And the thing with purpose is that I always talk about it finds you. There's this thing, this misconception that we're supposed to go out and look for. I'm supposed to be finding my boss, my purpose. No. The thing already, it knows your blueprints. You came here with a blueprint. Your job is just to be open enough to have it appear in your life so for me I think because I was open to moving and just starting over I was telling God I'm tired of my comfort zone that's all I know for now where I'm going I don't know but I was open and once I was open then the seed got planted of Nigeria is where you're going and yes I wanted to be disobedient in the sense that I was like I don't want to go to Nigeria but then I also saw the signs you see what I mean? So that's how you know alignment is that even if it's not what you are thinking, because a lot of times our purpose is not what we think. Mm -hmm. People think purpose is this sexy thing all the time, but sometimes it's not what you're thinking. It's something else that God wants you to carry out. Your assignment is, is different from what you might be thinking. And so your job is to pay attention. Mm -hmm. So once I, 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 I said, it's okay, you know what, I'll test this thing because this thing is coming into my mind as though it's an assignment, mm -hmm. but I don't trust it. So let me ask. And then when I started saying things like my dad said yes, my mom said yes, I was like, ah, okay. Then I started talking to that producer, they were saying yes. And then the stranger at the bar, there's so many, I, I actually have a list on my phone where I was tracking the signs mm -hmm. that I was getting about this thing. I was writing them down so I wouldn't forget because that's how I know that that's the direction God wants me to go in. So I just follow. And so I just was following, you know, I said, I don't know how I'm going to get there. There's no job waiting for me like that. And you want me to now leave this job that I have, this very nice job for where? And so I was kind of negotiating with God, like, what's up now? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. you can't leave your girl like this mm -hmm. now. But God was like, don't worry, you're in alignment. I got you. Mm -hmm. And so when I was in alignment, that's how things were just appearing. Do you understand? And when those things start appearing, that's how you know. When you are not in alignment, it's the opposite. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. The signs are not really there. They are just forcing. They so are people forcing. need to be perceptive. They have to be perceptive. You have to ask for discernment. Mm-hmm. And so the signs aren't there. And sometimes the things you need to get to where they're not showing up. Mm-hmm. They are, it's like you're fighting something, you know? Whereas in my experience, so personally, I know I'm in God's alignment because a lot of things that I testify about, I cannot tell you how it really happened mm-hmm. per se. It's just like it landed on my like it just landed on my lap. I was mm-hmm. like, oh, okay, this and that. So everything, even in Nigeria, you know. So I worked that job for like a year and a half. You know, I worked that job for like a year and a half, and um, then there was a point where I had to make a decision whether I would go back, I would stay here, and because the job needed me to come back for some reasons, and I was like, "Hey, fear came again. He visited me. He visited me. He visited me." And fear was like, "In this environment, you want to let go of a dollar job for what? Mm. For Nigeria? Why would you do that? Go back to America." And there was no fallback option then, right? It was just my job, my American job. So I was like, ah. But like I said, we're in alignment. You know, I just said to myself, ah, so why would God then bring me here under these circumstances that have been like so like precise, almost supernatural, only for him to then say, yeah, go back. And I didn't really do anything. Like I was just here. I was working American hours. I was always in Boston for work. I was never really knew I was here for like a year and a half. So I was just asking, like, so is it? No, it, no, that can't be. All of these signs, I went back and looked at the signs. I was like, all of these things could not have happened only for me to do a U-turn. Mm-hmm. It's not adding up. Sure. So I decided that, okay, for the first time in my life, I'm going to quit. Mm-hmm. I've never done that before. I've Always, I've never quit a job. Like, what? And so, I told them I was going to stay in Nigeria. I didn't have anything else. And I was just like, faith, leap, the net will appear. Mm-hmm. And that's what I did. I read somewhere that um, when you quit the US job, I don't know if it was this particular remote mm-hmm. work or the when you're working in full time mm. before you moved here, but mm. you had panic attacks. Oh yeah, I had major panic attacks. Like mm. after I did this, that's why I said like fear happens. It doesn't go away, but you just have to talk over it. You have to do over it. You have to like, you have to, your actions must be the opposite of what you're feeling. Mm. You know, so even though I was fearful and I was having panic attacks, I was like, <sighs> you don't have a job. Meanwhile, mm. like being the risk adverse person I am, low key, I had savings. I, I mean, I've, I've never been. So, I, please, I'm not. I'm not asking anybody to just like move to Nigeria with no like nest egg or something that will allow you to be comfortable mm-hmm. while you feel like don't do that. That's kind of okay. not. So, I definitely took. Like I said, I do my part. I always do my part in okay. on the journey. I just wait for the rest mm-hmm. to appear. And so, I did my part, and the rest was just like, let's see what happens, you know. And so. Like I said, I just said, you know what? I'm not under any immediate pressure. I don't need to go back and I need to see this assignment through. Yes. And so I made the very difficult decision, but I said, okay, I'll just stay. So I stayed. And then for a few months, I was panicking because that was just the first time where I just didn't have a job. Like I've always had a job, multiple jobs as a matter of fact. So I was just like, okay. What is this feeling? Well, I read this book that I really loved, which was, uh, it's a book by Tim Ferriss called The 4-Hour Work Week. I talk about it all the time. And in that book, he talks about how, you know, um, we should not fall for the scam, which is retirement. Because he calls it a scam in a way, because he says... um, Everybody's doing all of this because you're saying one day, one day, I shall get to retire and I'll get to rest. I'll get to look back and say, okay, all my work, this is what I did with it. I mean, say, but nobody wonders, will I make it to retirement? So you're just assuming. You don't know if you'll be in good health. You don't even know if the money that you're anticipating you will have 
will be there. So his talk, like in the book, the way the book was talking to me, um, was in the sense of, listen, take mini retirement. So part of what he would do was that, like he would have these jobs and he was like, if you're a valuable person, you should be able to get a job as many times as you need to get a job. And if you're living a minimal life, meaning that you're not living above your means, meaning that you are living, you know, a free life where you don't, you're not burdened with too many material things. Your job is a means to an end. Because he said that carrot that they're hanging, that retirement when you're 70 or 60 something, you'll be so tired by then that they would have used you to finish that. The rest would just be for you waiting to just, you know. So it's like, use this time that you have your youth, right? To enjoy your life when you don't have so many responsibilities, when you can just go. And so I remember being like, ah, oh, instead of being panicked, maybe this should be one of my mini mm-hmm. retirements. Cause it's not like okay. I didn't have the means to be okay. Like I was just panicking because I wasn't used to the feeling of okay. not having a job or not really any other way. So all of a sudden my mindset set changed and I just was like, okay, let me travel because that's what I love to do. Yeah. So, you know, I traveled, I read, oh my God, I finally had time to read, yeah. I had time to sleep. And then I also had time to listen to podcasts because, you know, Nigeria is intense and you don't realize that like there's never enough quiet moments in sure. the day sure. just to do a simple thing, like just read a book. Yeah. Like by the time I get home now, like there'll be something going yeah. on, my phone will be ringing. It's just a very intense place. And so, all of a sudden I had quiet and then one of the luxuries that I also had was that I was able to then think about what do I want my next move to look like? And I think a lot of people don't have that luxury because a lot of times you just roll from one job to the next because they're just looking for like, ah, I need to get another job, another salary. So they are not really thinking of like the full picture of what you want mm-hmm. for yourself, you know? And so that time that I had, I was like, okay, what would actually make you really happy right now? And I was like, and on my vision board in January, I had put on the vision board that I really wanted to work with women in Nigeria. It was just on my heart. And I didn't know what it would look like. I had this NGO that I was thinking of, or some other things that I was thinking of doing. But I just wasn't sure. I just was like, okay, well, again, I set the intention. That's all I did. I just said, okay, well, I told them that this is the kind of thing I'm looking to do. And we'll see. And I did my part. I told people, by the way, oh, I like, you know, I like working with women and women initiatives and women programs. And this is my background. And I just left it. And that's how I got the call from Greenhouse, um, from VGG saying that there was a program that they wanted to launch. And it was the first female focused accelerator program in Nigeria. And at that time, I didn't know that Google was going to come on board. But I just thought, again, when you're when your strategy is there for you to see, you know what to say yes to. So yes, I could have waited for other things. Like, oh, let me think, let me look around, let me see what else. I'm not ready yet. But because I remembered what was on that vision board, and when that call came, I just said yes. Because I was like, that that is an alignment. Yes. So I said yes to it, and you know the story. So that was one of really, one of my most amazing experiences in Nigeria was just, Helping to set that up and, you know, get it going. And it's in its second cohort. And I was at the demo day the other day and I was just like, wow, it's still happening. It's great. It's just good to yeah. see, you know, something that you had a part in just still growing. And so I did that. And then I moved on and I took another leap. And that leap was a really good leap because that was how I founded the Bloom Africa. And the launch was really amazing because I don't know how the universe did it, but all of a sudden, Lovey Ajayi was in town, mm-hmm. Bozma St. John was in town, Funa Muduka was in town, Justina was in town, and there were all people like Justina at the time was an executive at Apple. Um, at the time, Funa was an executive at Netflix. Lovey Ajayi is obviously an amazing woman. She was, um, and still is, sorry, the one of New York Times bestselling authors, also just a digital strategist. You know, she's just amazing. And then of course, Bozma is like a marketing maven. And my little self, I just asked them, I said, do you people mind, I'm trying to launch something. Do you want to help me launch it? And they were like, ah, standard, no problem. So this thing that I thought was just a small thing, I just, it's just an idea, but it was just on my vision board. And I remember I was like, I cannot let this year end. It's the last thing that I have left to do. So I have to execute on it. And so I just said, 
just ask them, even though they were here for vacation, I know people don't like to do things like, you know, they just want to relax. But they were like, sweet. They're like, no, let's do it. We we're like, yeah, sure. That's how they all showed up. And at that time, I thought it was like just a small event, like 70 people. And I just thought, oh, it's not going to be a big deal. It's just going to be it. And later on, looking back, I was like, OMG, I cannot believe all those women came together for me and just for this thing that they didn't even know. They just trusted me that, okay, whatever she says she's doing must be amazing. We'll show up. Because these are women that are really accomplished and they could have asked me a thousand questions. What is it? Who's going to be there? What exactly? They didn't ask me. And they just like, sure, for free. Women that charge God knows how much just to speak. Lovey's YouTube video, her TEDx talk has over a million views. Wow. It's, she's not to play with. So for her to just show up for me like that was really like mm-hmm. a big deal. So I used that time in between Greenhouse Lab to do that. And from there, I'm now over here where you meet me now mm-hmm. in a, you know, in this role. And that's also been very interesting, you know, marrying my love of city planning, you know, real estate with technology has been an interesting ride. And so like I told you at the beginning of this podcast, I'm evolving, so I'm open, and that's the key. It's just be open and don't fight with whatever the plan is because it's not your plan. It's not your plan. Your plan, yes, it's good for you to plan, but ultimately, your plan must also be in alignment with the, the ultimate plan, you understand? And so for me, that's just all I seek is just alignment with the ultimate I hear from you that um, it is not okay to just set your vision board, but you must also talk to people about it. Oh, well, yes, you must take accountability exactly. for it. It's not just about exactly. putting it and then waiting for, waiting for their actions. Happen. No, it's not a miracle thing. It's There is miracle involved, I think, because like I said, some of the things that I've been, you know, but part of it too, like I said, was because I was just intentional. So I think what visioning does for me is that it allows me to be intentional about my life. Okay. So that my life, I, I'm not leaving it just to chance, just to win. I know what to say yes to. I know what my dreams were for this year. I know why I said yes mm. to some opportunities and why I said no to other things. I know how I was moving this year. And next year, maybe, you know, I'll move differently. I don't know. But whatever it is, I know that once you set it, then you have to do your part Yes, that's key. key. It's not just about putting it somewhere and looking at it every day and then going about your normal life. Mm. No, it's a project plan. So if you're going to save money, you know that the money will just appear in your bank account Mm. now. You too, you must make decisions that are like, am I going to buy Asher Bill? Am I going to put the money and divert it into my savings that I cannot touch, that is locked? Mm. 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 Yes, that's the answer is yes, because that's what you said you were going to do. So that one is just intentional. Now, is it possible that somebody might come up to you around that see me and be like, ah, this guy, there's someone you know that's, ah, that we can make together. And you'll be like, what? As in, I said that my goal for this year was, you know, like, so that's where the miracle, but it doesn't mean that you're not also doing your own part. And then when that person comes, you remember that, ah, you have this goal. So maybe I should say yes to this opportunity because it's part of my overall goals for this year. So that's how the whole thing comes together to work is that it's both a strategy is both faith is also included with your, you know, leaping and just saying yes to the right things, you know. All of those things come together, I think, to kind of build out the experience, yeah. Well, what would you say were your major pain points in the course of your career, Jen? Um, Honestly, major pain points is just quieting the fear, you know. Mm-hmm. That's just the biggest thing is that for someone like me, again, who's very risk adverse i still am in spite of all my talk big talk you know trust me i'm still i fight it every day i have to push through the fair i have to i have to tell myself do it anyway and yes i know you're scared but you just i talk to myself i affirm things with myself lagos is not an easy town to live in anyone that lives here knows that it can be challenging there are things and people that you run across that challenge you but and like I said, if you know what your big picture is and you know what you're shooting for and what your goal is, you don't let that stop you. You go right, you, I bulldoze through it. You know, if I see if something is standing in my way and I know that I made a, I set an intention for that year, that thing has to go. And so I'll move it, I'll shift it, you know, and that's just how I live. And so I think even all the challenges that I've had here, when I look back at them, I just move them out of the way and I keep going. 
Okay. That's what I do. So, some quick questions yeah. to quick wrap up. So, if you could tell yourself something, tell your um, look back, tell yourself something ten years ago, what would that be? Tell your younger self. Trust the process. Mm. I'm still telling myself that now, but yeah, I think when you really learn to trust the process, it makes life a lot easier. Okay. You're not fighting against it. Yeah. If you could step into my shoes, what would you have asked yourself that I needed? Um, what countries are next on my list? <laughs> <laughs> uh, one day I'm going to become a professional traveler. Uh, it's one of my that's one of my lives that I'm going to live at some point. It's okay. part of my vision for myself. But for now, in the near in the next four weeks, I'll be going to Senegal, India and Sri Lanka. Okay. What's one key wisdom you, you would like to leave with the audience? One key wisdom, um, it's okay to be fearful, but it's not okay to let it um, control your destiny. Mm. Um, it's okay to feel insecure about some things and to not know but it's also okay to set a plan, to set a goal, and to try your best. You owe it to yourself to always try. And I assure you that when you try, um, you'll find that, like I said, the universe will somehow conspire with you. God will somehow, if you're in alignment and you know because you're following the signs, um, that things will start to appear for you, things will start to happen for you. And um, yeah, so be you can be fearful, but don't let it stay for too long. So I guess I would say be fearless. Mm -hmm. um, plan your life, be strategic about your life goals. And remember that you only have one life. So live your life. Like don't live it according to somebody else's expectations of you. I know it's harder. It's easier said than done, but you really must understand that you have one life to live. And once it's over, that's it. You're done. So this is not a... We're not at a dress rehearsal. This is not a rehearsal. We are all on stage right now. This is the real deal. Everybody is on. And so we must learn how to take charge of our lives and how to own our stories and how to move forward and charge forward. So, Who would you like us to interview next? Who would I like you to interview next? Wow. Um, go ahead and interview my sister, Tara. Tara. Yes. Okay. Why, why Tara? <laughs> She's a well of wisdom. Mm -hmm. She's a well of wisdom. And I love wise people. Okay. I would tell you to go interview my dad, but you know, he's far away. But mm. like I said, wise people that have gone through life, but not just gone through it, but have paid attention while going through mm. it. That's the key. Because a lot of us are living, but we're just living. We're just going through the motions every day. There are some of us that are paying attention, literally trying to say, instead of saying, why is this happening to me? It's always, what is this teaching me? Mm. That's the question. And if you go through life, when you realize you're a student of life, you realize that every experience, good or bad, is teaching you something. And yes, once you get over the disappointment or the excitement or whatever it is, then you have to sit back and reflect and say, what are the gems? What are the things that I need to take and put into my pocket as I continue on this road? Because I'm gonna need those things further down the road mm. and so I always recognize people that I speak with that I know are paying attention mm. as they're going on this journey called life and those are the people that I think you should talk to okay yeah. thank you very much thank you for the first book you mentioned have you remembered the oh yes 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 um um it's by Paulo Coelho um why is my brain sorry the alchemist the alchemist, the alchemist. thank okay. you and I just butchered his name, sorry, because I dropped out of Spanish <laughs> class. So no worries. I dropped out of my Spanish class. But yes, it's called The Alchemist. It's one of my favorite books. Um, I had a brain freeze for a minute. I also mentioned the four-hour work yeah, week. Yeah, by Tim Ferriss. which I love. That's Tofsin Dorotwe. She's the CEO of Bloom Africa and the COO of Fumo Realty. Thank you for listening to our show this week. If you liked it, do leave us a review a comment and share with your friends tell a friend to tell a friend to tell a friend and to tell another friend 
We would also love to read from you. So please, do send us a tweet or leave a comment on Instagram at Origins AF. You can also write to us at OriginsAfricaPodcast at gmail.com. Remember, do subscribe at wherever you get your podcast. Google Podcast, Apple Podcast, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, amongst others. Join us next time as we have a chat with Olaolua Awujudu, the co-founder and CEO of eSettlement Limited. Our sound producer this week was Tumisha Jani, and the theme song was composed by Just Ritimi. I'm Oshaya and you've been listening to Origins Africa podcast. Bye for now. My father told me life is not a bit of